Hey everyone, I've got another OCHEM practice exam for you. Uh, as with the previous, I encourage you to uh, pause anytime you see a question, try it for yourself, and then unpause, and I'll go through the explanation for you, or just listen if you like. So let's start with this one. Uh, we've got sulfuric acid here. So we, we have a uh, source of protons, right? We've got, we're going to protonate something with acid. You're going to protonate something. So what can be protonated? Well, only the hydroxyl group, right? Hydroxyl can protonate. So uh, let's just, let's, we'll go down here. Got that methyl. And then now we have this situation here. So we have a positive charge there. We know that water is a good leaving group, right? We, uh, uh, when oxygen is positively charged, we're get, that is going to be able to leave and uh, so that we get a neutral water molecule. That's favorable. But here, we're not going to want to we're, we're not going to want to uh, have this water molecule leave behind a primary carbocation. That's not really the best thing that can happen. So instead, because cyclobutane is not favorable, right? We've got some uh, some some strain, some angles, some some strain due to those uh, bond angles there. Uh, this is actually going to pop open. This will pop open to kick off water, right? And the reason is this. We're going from a five-membered ring, or from a four-membered ring, to a five-membered ring. So what happens? So uh, this used to be uh, th this used to be here, but now this is that carbon where water left, and uh, we've got this uh, methyl group there, and we now have the positive charge here, right? Because if this so this carbon had four bonds and now it's over there, which means that this carbon lost a bond. The carbon with the methyl group lost a bond, right? And so this is, a, this is basically a E1 elimination, essentially, uh, although it's a dehydration. We're going to call this E1D, essentially. And so we're, all we got to do is finish this up. We're just going to go ahead and grab a proton from either of these Right, if we have, uh, we, let's just say water is going to do it. We've made a water molecule over here. It's presumably aqueous conditions. So water can go ahead and grab this, and we're going to finish that off, finish the elimination. So there's our alkene product. Uh, this is now an sp2 center, so that methyl is flattened out. So certainly we have to recognize that the hydroxyl is going to get protonated. And then it was just this, uh, this, this little bit of an interesting step where we see that the four-membered ring is going to expand to generate the five-membered ring uh, rather than leaving the primary carbocation. That way we get a bigger ring and we get a tertiary carbocation. Then we just finish the elimination and there we go. Okay, moving on to the next one. So we've got this alkyne, right? We've got a carbon-carbon triple bond, and we've got some conditions here. This is one of our flashcard reactions here. We have a few methods of going from an alkyne to an alkene, right? And we have to recognize those conditions. Uh, so these are some conditions of going from the alkyne to the e-alkene. Right, we have Lindler's catalyst. That's how we get to the Z alkene. But these are the conditions to get to the E alkene. So let's draw this part of the molecule. And so this was, is the start of where the alkyne was. But now we've got an alkene. We've got an E alkene. Right. So E meaning these are now on opposite sides. This part of the chain and this methyl. Right, so we can even number them if we need to. If this gets, sometimes the geometry gets a little confusing. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are not IUPAC numbers. This is just if for our own sake of uh, being able to maintain the correct number of carbons. Right, we see that once we were here, that's where that triple bond was. So it's where the double bond is now, and it's got to be E. So. We recognize that these are the conditions going from an alkyne to an e-alkene. Okay, looking at this, what happens here? We've got an alcohol, and then we've got two steps here. Uh, first, we've got tosyl chloride in pyridine. So these are the conditions for tosylation. So if this looks unfamiliar, I have a tutorial on leaving group derivatives. That will be helpful here because what happens from reaction one 
is we're just going to turn this from a hydroxyl into O tosyl. And if we remember what the tosyl group is, it's we've got a benzene ring in there. It's just something that makes the, it turns the hydroxyl group into a good leaving group. Hydroxyl, very bad leaving group because hydroxide is unstable, it's very reactive. However, O tosyl is a great leaving group because that oxy anion would no longer be localized on the oxygen atom. It is stabilized by resonance throughout that benzene ring in the tosyl group. And notice the retention of stereochemistry. By tosylating that hydroxyl, we do not alter the stereochemistry at that center. Then what we've got is now a just it's just a regular SN2, right? We cannot do SN2 on a hydroxyl group. We can do SN2 on O tosyl because this is a great leaving group. So we've got CN minus, that's a great SN2 leaving group. It's just going to come over here and do that. And then uh, recall that SN2 involves inversion of stereochemistry because of the backside attack. It must uh, approach 180 degrees. Uh, opposite the carbon leaving group bond to access that antibonding orbital, which is the LUMO for that substrate. And so this is going to be our product. We tosylated to make this a good leaving group. And then we just did SN2, invert the stereochemistry, and there you have it. So that's that one. Uh, okay, over here. All right, so we've got this substrate and uh, we've got ethoxide. So ethoxide looks like uh, we're probably going to be doing some elimination here, right? This is, uh, we've got some beta branching. This is a little bit sterically hindered. We probably aren't going to want to do, uh, aren't going to want to substitute. But uh, we, when we, whenever we do E2 on, on a cyclohexane derivative, we have to draw that chair conformation because we want to know what's going on, right? So let's draw that chair. So let's say that this carbon is this carbon, and we've got bromine going up, right? That wedge bond means up. And then we can go over here, we've got an ethyl group going up. And then over here, we've got a methyl group going down. So this is one chair conformation uh, of, for this molecule, and it is also the chair conformation from which E2 must proceed. Why is that? If you don't recall, check out my tutorial on E2 on cyclic systems. Uh, in order for E2 to proceed on a cyclohexane derivative, both the leaving group and the proton being extracted must be uh, in the ant uh, or in the axial uh, must be in the axial position because that is the only way for them to be anti-paraplanar, right? We know that they have to be anti to one another, right? The proton being extracted and the leaving group have to be anti to one another in a Newman diagram, the only way for that to happen is this situation here, right? If you drew the Newman projection, you could see that these are 180 degree dihedral angle. They're totally opposite each other. And so this is important to do because we do have a beta proton here, right? We have to know that there's a beta proton here and there's a beta proton here, right? This is on the dash. This is on the wedge. And if we didn't draw the chair, we wouldn't notice, we might think it's equally favorable to get either of these protons. But in fact, this proton here is not available for elimination because it is not uh, anti to this leaving group. So instead, right, we are exclusively going to get this one. Let's go over here, go around about this way. Okay, so that's going to go and put the pi bond there and kick off that bromine there. So that is, th this was important to do because we had to recognize that this is the only proton that is available for elimination. And so what are we going to get? Let's draw the molecule the way we had it. Uh, originally. So what happened? We now have a pi bond here and this is gone, right? So there's our new pi bond and then this is now flattened out. This is now an sp2 center so we don't have a wedge bond there anymore, right? So this is right. We could we could just as well have have gone over here now that we know, right? We can do that this way because we do want to draw the product in regular line notation and so uh, we've got that pi bond there that's gone but this methyl group no chemistry happened over there. So you do want to maintain that methyl group and you want to maintain the stereochemistry at that center because no, no chemistry occurred. So this is specifically going to be the stereochemistry of that product. So there's an E2 on a cyclic system. A couple of, uh, of uh, multiple choice here. If a compound possesses one or more asymmetric carbons, the compound may be chiral, always will be chiral, never will be chiral. So a couple of things to discuss here. Okay, it says one or more. Right, so we're talking about any number of chiral centers. If a molecule 
has one chiral center, right? Let's say we've got one chiral center. It must be chiral, right? Any molecule with one chiral center is chiral. But let's say we have two chiral centers. Well, that the, you know, then you got to look at it, right? Let's say we have, uh, let's say we have this. Let's say we have bromine and bromine. Well, this is, there are two chiral centers, right? We must understand that these are chiral centers. However, this is meso and therefore achiral overall, right? So here's an example of two chiral centers or asymmetric carbons and the molecule is achiral overall. However, if we change the structure, let's say we have a bromine and let's say we have a hydroxyl over here, right? The, this is no longer meso, this is not a mirror plane because these are not the same group, right? So this is chiral. So one, if it said one asymmetric carbon, then the answer would be always will be chiral. But because it says one or more, we don't know. There are molecules with multiple asymmetric carbons or chiral centers that are chiral. Many, many or even most of them uh, are. Uh, but there are, uh, there are molecules with one or more chiral centers that are not chiral. So we have to say maybe chiral. We don't know, right? It could be either. Okay, now take a look at this one. Which of the following alkenes is the most stable? So we've got butene. So let's, uh, we're, we're going to draw these out. So here's butene and one butene. That means on car the, the double bond starts on carbon one. And now we've got two ethyl and we've got three methyl. Right, so that is that first one. What is the degree of, of substitution on this? This is disubstituted. That's a disubstituted alkene. And we do recall that the more substituted an alkene is, the more stable it is for reasons of hyperconjugation, similar to stability of carbocations. So that's disubstituted. Now we've got a pentene. Let's draw this over here. Here's our pentene. Double bond is on carbon two. Starts on carbon two. So there's that. Now we've got three, four, oh, and it's E, which is just the regular zigzag, so that's fine. Three, four, dimethyl. So one, two, three, four, dimethyl, two pentene. So what is the degree of substitution here? This carbon has one alkyl group. This carbon has two alkyl groups. So this is tri-substituted, right? Uh, remember, just in case it's confusing, right? Over here, we have two hydrogens, so that's not it. Right? Di-substituted over here, we've got tri-substituted. So this is better than this. So we know that so far. Now we've got another pentene. This is another two pentene. So starting with carbon two, two, three dimethyl. So here's carbon two, here's carbon three. So how, what do we got here? We got one alkyl, two alkyl, three alkyl, four alkyl. This is tetra substituted, which is the most substituted that an, al that an alkene can be. And therefore, this is the most stable alkene of these. So definitely we're going with number three there. Now, E2 reactions, this is a little bit of a throwaway. We know that with an E2 reaction, we're going to form an alkene. However, there's not really any correlation uh, as to whether it will be cis or trans. First of all, cis and trans are relative terms, so it, it depends entirely on what substituents are in the molecule. Uh, so we, there's really nothing here, right? We're just going to say that this can form either cis or trans alkenes. There's no correlation there. Okay, then one more. We're going to do another uh, IU pack here. So let's find the longest carbon chain. We don't even have to circle it. This is very uh, evidently like this, right? We know that this is the longest carbon chain. It's the only carbon chain. There's only one carbon chain here. So that part was easy. Now we've got a number left to right or right to left. Well, which direction has a substituent occurring sooner? Well, clearly that's going to be right to left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we're going to number le uh, right to left. Now, I'm actually going to delete these numbers because uh, we're going to be doing some conangled prelog. So just we'll remember that we're numbering this way, right? So this is carbon three, this is carbon four. So we need, uh, because the stereochemistry is shown here, we do have to, uh, we do have to label these as R or S. So let's do this one first. Let's use our Conningle prelog convention. This is going to be priority one. Hydrogen is going to be priority four. 
certainly, right? And then we've got two identical carbons. Well, this carbon is attached to hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. This is attached to hydrogen, carbon, bromine. So this is going to be priority three. Uh, no, sorry. This is going to be priority two. It's higher priority, and this is priority three, right? So the, uh, and the, the lowest priority group is already away from us. So we can safely go like this, one to two to three. This one is S, okay? So that, so, so we can even begin, right? We've got three S. We know that that first stereo center is an S. And now, now we're gonna do the next one. So let's, uh, let's actually erase this stuff because we are gonna have to do the other one. Uh, so let's uh, assign the priorities for this other one here. We know that this is priority one and then we've got this uh, proton on the, impl the implied hydrogen on the wedge is going to be priority four. And then by the same logic before, this has got to be priority two. This has got to be priority three. So what do we do here? The lowest priority group is towards us. So we can either envision ourselves on the other side of the molecule, which uh, certainly you can do. A lot of people seem to have trouble with that. So let's just do a trick. Uh, as you remember from the Conigo prelog, uh, uh, tutorial, we can pretend that the lowest priority group is away from us. So in essence, we are, we are swapping groups one and four. We are pretending that the bromine is on the wedge and the hydrogen is on the dash. In doing so, we are inverting the stereo center, right? So, so that's part one. But now we just, we pretend that it is what we want. And then we go one to two to three, right? One to two to three. So that looks like it is counterclockwise and therefore S, right? We are going counterclockwise, but we inverted the stereo center in order to do that, right? So we actually have R, right? So looks like S, but we inverted the stereo center, so we invert our answer, and so we actually have R. So this is 3S for R, and then we, then we name the molecule. So we have 3, 4 dibromo, three, four dibromo, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is a heptane. So the main part of the molecule was super easy. It was just asking us to do a couple of, uh, of uh, assign some stereochemistry as well. So that is it for exam two. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.